It's good to have rugby back. After two weeks of discussing mergers and minutiae, there's something lovely about just watching people clatter into Alan Wynne Jones and people clatter off Hamish Watson. Scotland and Wales have used the break week very differently. Whilst Wales tried their hardest to create pessimism in the midst of not just a title chase, but their greatest win streak ever, Scotland needed the week off just to find 15 men with functional hamstrings, currently hampered with more fresh injuries than the waiting room of a war hospital. And you wouldn't blame any Scotland fans, sitting in the crowd knowing at any moment Tooney may come over and ask them if they can play fullback from developing PTSD either. As Scotland showcased their best and their worst over an 80 minutes so stressful and frequently frustrating that it explains Townsend's hairline. With Wales in complete control over the first half before Scotland grabbed hold of the game, falling just short of claiming it for their own. So, how did Wales see it out? And how should Scotland feel after a game they almost won straight after almost being comprehensively smashed? Objectively, Scotland and Wales should have an awful lot in common, but these two teams are virtually antonyms in terms of mind Set, and that proved to be the difference on Saturday, with Wales's calmness seeing them pass Finn and Friends as frenzy mode. Maybe it's because the team are used to a Reeve trained Wales as a service, but Wales have more patience than a dyslexic doctor. This has been the secret to Wales' win streak, a composure in adversity and a belief in themselves. This Wales team believes it will get the job done by crook but thankfully not hook. This is core to how they attack. They have a confidence to keep the ball and the patience to wait for chances to present themselves, rather than just risking anything early. This is well showcased by how their attack changes when they get close to to the line. Across most of the field, they like to vary their play, using Anscombe's reputation as a running 10 to draw defenders before dropping off passes to forward carriers or trying to spark an attack wider. However, upon getting into the 22, Wales play everything off 9. They pick and go, they drive tight, even using their sizeable backs as alternative carrying options. However, there's one back who doesn't get involved, with Gareth Davis at scrum half dictating the immediate play and bringing runners onto the ball. This allows Gareth Anscombe to look at the bigger picture. When deep in the opposition territory, Wales's 10 receives far less ball. His job, instead, is to watch. What is Pack fights for every inch, Anscombe stands back and analyses the defence in real time. With Wales carrying, how does Scotland react? Do they trust their usual system and leave the fringes lesser defended? Do they cramp around the breakdown and thin their line in the middle? Do they fold inwards and leave space wide? It's Anscombe's role to keep an eye on this and call the play accordingly. He's been criticised in the Six Nations for not doing as much flashy stuff as Bigger or himself a year ago, but that's because it isn't really his job. A couple of years ago, Wales would have looked to involve Anscombe far more, and he would have looked to do far more, probably snuffing out this attack by running up a blind alley or throwing a mental loopy spin pass. But now, he just calmly watches the other 29 players, not focused on himself. Wales still bringing their backs into the game and looking to find width, but whereas most teams would consider that a job for the 10 to get going, Wales leave Anscombe to mastermind all from behind. Instead of doing something flashy, he waits for a chance to present itself. And when it does, he doesn't overplay it. He just throws a simple pass to Jonathan Davis, who ends up in perhaps the most perfect microcosm of the Welsh game plan. As our foxy friend finds himself confronted with a two-on-one, he knows he has two options. Pass to Adams, or go himself. Instead of predetermining the decision, Davies holds his nerve and checks. He knows King Orn has to make the same decision. Does he stay on Davies? Does he drift off to Adams? The split second King Orn begins to drift, Davies dives to the line and finishes the try. Had King Orn stuck on Davies, could have just as easily thrown the pass and put Adams in the corner. It's just taking half a second to read the game in front of you, rather than manically making your mind up as you catch it. This was exactly where Scotland went wrong. Their backline is capable of being lethal in attack, but it seems like nobody knows that better than Scotland. They back themselves, but they don't trust themselves. Willing to go for risky plays constantly because they know they have the ability, but not willing to wait for the moment which it might actually be on because they lack the composure. That's perhaps best surmised here. Scotland are given a penalty advantage and instantly go for the low percentage play, figuring they might as well have a shot because the penalty's coming. Contrast that to how Wales continue to press on penalty advantage, treating it as a safety blanket, not an excuse to go tart and kamikaze. Scotland then go for the scrum from the penalty, turning down a shot at goal, not trusting themselves to get back down into Wales' territory to accumulate the other points they'd need to take the lead. Again, it's a sharp contrast to last week, where Wales did didn't panic after England went 10-3 up. They just chipped away at their lead, believing they'd get more chances for points as the game went on. Scotland put a lot of pressure on the Welsh line, but it took a ridiculous piece of skill to break it. Now, I've confessed to being somewhat aroused by Scotland's attack on this channel before, but Darcy Graham's try went beyond that. And so, I'd like to present some fresh analysis on my new wife. Wales' excellent defence is built on how bloody good Jonathan Davis is at pulling off remarkable spot tackles, saving his side's blushes on so many occasions on just Saturday alone. Knowing this, Townsend designed the move to catch him out. By placing dual distributors Russell and Horn next to each other, Wales have to watch both, meaning the main Welsh line covers McHook and proto Glaswegian Grigg on the dummy run, trusting if the ball does come out the back to Russell, the Fox will take care of him. However, because he's so good, Wales' system is happy to leave space on the inside of Davis, which a thin flick to blindside winger Byron McGuigan exploits. From there, it's just two pieces 
a lovely handling and some excellent support play that gives Graham the opportunity to dive in the corner, which which he does because you know, there was a try, they scored it. Scotland were able to put as much pressure on Wales as they were thanks to the re-emergence of another key theme from this year's Six Nations, the sheer importance of the fullback position. With Sanjay the specialist salmon hurting one of his ridiculous limbs, Wales were forced to shuffle Anscombe backwards. Whilst he's played plenty of fullback before, Anscombe's positioning is not that of Williams and he left a lot of space open, allowing Russell to just pin Wales back in their own territory for virtually the entire second half with a couple of silly errors by Wales gifting Scotland the ball and putting them under more pressure than they really had to be under. Pressure that was possibly more than doubled by the presence of Hamish Watson, who came on and clattered like nobody's business, beating more defenders in 20 minutes than any other player did in 80, able to break tackles like his teammates could break their own bodies. Having him back is a huge boost for Scotland team, who were about two more injuries away from being able to call Monopoly on the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, and yet nonetheless have to travel to Twickenham and put the Calcutta Cup they fought so hard for last year on the line. And Wales head towards Grand Slam Saturday, hoping not to get caught up in the politics again. This week, they somehow managed to claim victory in a tireless, hugely physical battle after a long week of foregoing training to sit through meetings and negotiations, which is a bit like Jean-Claude Juncker going out and winning gladiators on a Sunday. Next week, however, Wales play defending champions Ireland for the title, the winner setting themselves up as a major World Cup contender. It might be the final round of the Six Nations, but the way things are going, let's hope rugby doesn't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. We're almost at the end of the Six Nations. How did that happen? How do we get to this point already? How do we get there? I don't know. I don't know, to be honest. Um, it's gone very quickly, but we're one week away from the final round of the Six Nations. We're just days away now, um, so that's very exciting. Um, that was a video on the, the penultimate round. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching that. Thank you to everyone that supports it on Patreon as well um, and has donated some dosh in exchange for these videos. Um, it's the reason I'm able to make them and able to, you know, continue to turn ones out the week of release rather than them taking me hundreds of hours. Well, maybe to put the hundreds of hours in in that week there. Um, beyond that, thank you to those of you who have continued to use the Super League. Again, we're coming to the final week of this and it's got very, very tight at the top, a bit like the real Six Nations. Uh, still top, as it has been the entire way, is the Elite Biscuit Farmer's Vivid Oysters, a familiar name but just two points behind, that's like, you know, two missed tackles or similar uh, in the league, is BG's Cheeky Sardines, which has really crept up, you know, he's been there or thereabouts and then climbed up in the last few weeks uh, and then coming into third, again, just six points off second, so entirely possible he could take it in the final round, is Andy Powers Golf Buggy Lessons, which is not something I was familiar with, um, and I hope he wore more than the jock strap for those... Uh, when Mr. Pricey was taking him round, uh, who took the yellow cap this weekend. There is going to be, Super are going to send a yellow cap to whoever wins. Um, so, you know, there's a few more people in contention there or thereabouts. Um, but at the moment, it's very tight at the top. We'll have to see how that one goes. Likewise, I'll see you next week when we'll have more rugby stuff, um, when we'll know who's won the Six Nations for 2019. See you then. Bye.